Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I thank Manoj and his better half for the invitation and uh, arranging this excellent CMV. We always thought our group chan at the Sadecha season, Made Bolajatar Sagar Ekdam, okay. Hi, so everybody, please enjoy. And all uh, the uh, speakers who have come from outside Aurangabad, before you leave, don't forget to take pan from Tarapan Center, it's on Zomato also. Now, interesting cases in leukemia. Uh, in uh, August 2019, we had a meeting at Calcutta and all the CMC alumni were there. So we had a very frantic discussion at the time of bank banquet about what you mean by interesting. So, and everybody said that to you interesting, lagta hai, wohi interesting. So that was the conclusion of that uh, meeting. But anyway, that is a joke apart. Uh, interesting actually means uh, whatever arouses your curiosity and that's what it, the dictionary meaning and the curiosity often leads to new diagnosis or thinking of what we might miss or what we have missed in the past and so the mistake should not be happening so this is the first scenario so basically we miss something and then that becomes an interesting case means uh, you you are going somewhere, you know where you are going, but then you suddenly find something else here. And this is the common thing. And this in day to day practice, it happens with everybody. There is nothing wrong in it because we are all humans. So you get a patient and you miss a bit of spherocyte here and there, or one or two percent blast in the blood. And later on, the patient comes and you diagnose leukemia or spherocytosis or goes to your colleague and he or she diagnoses it. So there is nothing wrong in it. But this is one of the definition of interesting what we made out. And this is a typical googly, you feel that there is something, a mountain behind, then you find a seat. You have a patient with pancytopenia, you do think that, oh, this is a plastic anemia, and then you diagnose a case of promalocytic leukemia, or a child with pancytopenia, spinomegaly, you suspect leukemia, and you find gotcha's disease in this bone marrow. So this is another interesting, and this is what, the straightforward cases. Now our boss... And Dr. Aloga and Dr. Maman that time said that why you people are discussing, why don't you think something that is straightforward should not be interesting because straightforward cases give you maximum satisfaction, the ride is pretty smooth and as far as leukemia is concerned, you have a nice road and the end is good, the like ultra low risk, low risk childhood ALL with low count, no organ megaly, normal LDH. Now everybody loves to treat the children because with the pre-induction they go into remission and the rest of the treatment can be on OPD basis. Similarly, APML with severe pancytopenia, hair cell leukemia and to name a few. So these are the straightforward cases which are also interesting because they are the cases which give you the maximum satisfaction. So what makes the cases interesting? The first is the way you present or who is presenting. Uh, the question mark is for me because I don't know whether I'm a good presenter or not. But if you hear a person like Dr. M.B. Agarwal and even if you speak on a subject like boring subject like congenital disorder erythropoietic anemia, everybody is so mesmerized in what he speaks. And secondly, one of the speakers, one of the teachers, Barbara Ben, if you had an opportunity to listen to her, she will just focus one cell on the screen and she will talk about half an hour, 40 minutes just describing that cell. So there are people will make things interesting, the things may not be interesting and should interest the target and it should be of day-to-day -day utility, then, the, then only the people are going to be interested and what phase of practice you are in. If you are a beginner, you are interested in smaller things, the smaller things are definitely interesting, but as you go further in your practice, you are going to concentrate more on the treatment part and what is available to me or the field is the still is frustrating that my patient is still going to die. And speciality, of course, the hematology, the investigation, whatever done in the world at the moment is available in India, whether it should be next generation sequencing, whole genomic analysis, it's all here. And the material is very simple, either just a prick of blood or a bit of bone marrow. And the age of the person, if the, you speak to, if somebody is speaking who is 70, 75, he'll just speak on morphology, he'll speak on nothing else, but that will be still very catchy and interesting. So, Leukemias, diagnosis relatively easy, not because of us, because we have very robust, accurate, reliable modes of diagnostic prognosis available at our hand. And just we heard, Dr. Shruti, that the morphology is not redundant yet. So that is very important. Uh, just what simple case, you can see the histogram, a three-part differential. There is anemia, 
and very high MCV. You just heard that MCV can be very high. It can be B12 folate deficiency or anything. Now, this person has already received B12 and the day-to-day -day experience, in megaloblastic anemia, the B12 deficiency MCV is usually is 98 to 115 and 18. That's the usual experience. It can be higher. This patient had just palpable spleen and mild iterus. Now, the direct Coombs test was strongly positive and retic count was elevated. Uh, this was this peripheral uh, EDTA tube, BD tube. You can see the agglutinated red cells at the margin of the tube. This is another picture or uh, red cell agglutination. So you know that there is agglutination and this is the peripheral smear, you see the agglutination. So is this AIHA? Yes, this is AIHA, primary or secondary. 56 year old gentleman, you need a bone marrow, aspirate showed erythroid hyperplasia, mature lymphocytes, bone marrow biopsy, showed CLL. I did the flow cytometry, the, I have not mentioned it, should be CLL. So the usual presentation of CLL with AIH is usually in advanced phase, but it can present as AIH in any individual. So the bottom line is in a Coombs positive anemia, bone marrow is necessary in most of the cases. That is very important. But here you don't treat CLL, you just treat autoimmune hemolytic anemia, you don't have to treat CLL. And now, the similar presentation, you have a MCV, if you have just seen the blue color of the slide, here is a very violet color, this is normal PS. Now, when you see this, this is your diagnosis with the multiple myeloma, why the color changes? Because of the abnormal paraprotein that gives that bluish tinge to your slide. So, even though we have the diagnostic modalities, the basic is still there, the basic whatever happening in the lab. So very high DCT, very sorry, very high MCV and positive DCT, AIH is the one of the cause and in the adults, multiple myeloma and lymphocytic, lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma or a Waldenstrom's macroglobulinema. Both these conditions, because the abnormal paraprotein leads to red cell agglutination and the DCT can be falsely positive or real positive. So this is to be kept in mind. This is another case. This is normal histogram. Here is the patient. Anemia, thrombocytopenia, and elevated WBCs. Now you see the in three part, you see the population in the middle region. Usually the eosinophils, monocytes, basophils fall there, but these are not eosinophils obviously because there is anemia and thrombocytopenia. So this has to be a case of leukemia and we just saw a couple of slides. Uh, this is the hypogranular variant, very like folded nucleus. This picture is taken by Subhash through the eyepiece because I'm not very savvy about all these techniques. So this was a case of hypogranular variant of promyelocytic leukemia. And this is, you can pick it up just looking at the histogram. This could be lymphocyte, but there won't be anemia and thrombocytopenia. Now, this is how do you differentiate? These are the folded nucleus, this is the faggot cells, and this is the hypergranular variant of APML. Now, the real interesting case, but the credit here goes to molecular pathologist. 65 year old gentleman, anemia requiring blood transfusion every four to six weeks for last three months. Normal platelet count, slowly rising WBC, 87,000 at the time of consultation, hemoglobin 9.6 transfused moderate thrombocytopenia. 10 centimeter palpable spleen, weight loss of about six kgs and anorexia. Peripheral smear, neutrophils, a few myelocyte, metamyelocyte, blast 2%. And bone marrow shows the typical myeloproliferation with reduced erythrocytes, but not typical of any disease and reduced megakaryocytes. So this could be CML or the overall feature is myeloproliferation in accelerated phase. Biopsy shows the same picture. Now, MPD panel, all five parameters negative, karyotype it 46XY, NGS was always already requested. Meanwhile, transfusions, hydroxyurea, dinazol, erythropoietin. Now, this is what was shown in uh, next generation sequencing, CSF3R and ZBP1 mutation along with two AXL1 mutations. You can find out all these full forms in the book. I don't remember, so don't ask me what they are. So this is consistent with the diagnosis of chronic neutrophilic leukemia. Once it's really uncommon disorder now with, as we are doing more and more next generation sequencing, we'll probably diagnose more cases of this. 
and this is the um, NGS report. Uh, it should be clear, but as I said, 2XL mutation, uh, this is very recent. This was January 22. So this was a case of chronic neutrophilic leukemia. We just read in the books and this with the molecular pathology, we are able to diagnose this disease now. So these are the variety of mutations that you see, but the AXL1, ZBP and CSF3 are, are the commonly seen. The main features in PS and BM, apart from neutrophilia, is the almost complete absence of monocytes and eosinophils and basophils in peripheral blood and bone marrow. And megakaryocyte morphology is normal. So what is so curious about it? When we see we are doing in day-to-day -day practice, we'll just the differential count in the peripheral blood. If there are no monocytes, we won't even think about it. So I went back and saw the slide and really yeah, there were no monocytes. So that's the, that's the interesting part of it. We just assume that it's not there, but we don't think that why there is no monocyte in this person or why there is no eosinophil. So this is the hallmark on the peripheral, but we can still suspect it, which I missed. So these are the treatments which are not proven. Bone marrow transplant is the only cure. Dasatinib, Ruxotinib can be tried. The patient, I am not in touch with the patient. I don't know whether he is dead or he's with somebody else, but if he comes to you, give him Dasatinib. All good data is there, though it's not proven, but the data is still there. And these patients, they die of severe sepsis because all the neutrophils the patient is producing, they're all dysfunctional. So they die of sepsis. Those neutrophils are of no use. Now, chronic Neutrophilic leukemia, WHO is not able to classify it. It can be present as MPD and it can present as MDS MPD overlap. Now, next generation sequencing is important investigation if MPD panel is negative. And so here the credit goes to molecular pathology or molecular pathologies because only because of that we can specifically diagnose this entity. And this is the pathogenesis. So if you get a XL1 hit mutation or chip with or without dysplasia. And then second hit is with AXL1 or CSFB, then CSF3R, then this is neutrophilic leukemia. And this is going to present as MDS MPD. Now the second pathogenesis, the first hit is CSF3R followed by AXL1, then myeloproliferation. So this is very simplified how the disease can present in both the ways. Now we just shift to some treatment related part. This is a patient who is still admitted being going to be discharged next week. 22 year old male, newly diagnosed hypogranular APML, TLC at presentation 56,000. Now, uh, those who are not hemolysis, I must tell that those who treat this disease, we are extremely paranoid and very much attached to these patients because this disease is highly curable but we have to take them through first three to four weeks. Now, once that happens, the rest of the treatment is fairly straight. So this is a APML with high count. I try ATO plus three days of donorbicin with aggressive support, prophylactic dexamethasone to start immediately in the of high TLC. Fairly expected course for 19 days, mild differential incident syndrome in the form of fluid retention and hepatomegaly, but settled without pulmonary involvement. Around day 20, all drugs except ATO atra were stopped and planned for the discharge. So day 21 starts developing fever, high grade, about 101, three to spikes, five spikes per day, mild dry cup, CBC fairly normal. Day one, only round the clock paracetamol, urine blood culture sent. Further on, the reports were not conclusive. Day two, ongoing spikes, antibiotics started. Chest X-ray, CT chest, non-contributory, persistent dry cough, but no dyspnea, no hypotension. So add antifungal or next what? So need to sit and think what is wrong. So that's what one should do when you are stuck. So two possibilities were considered. High fever, dry cough, clear chest X-ray, CT chest, no response to antibiotics. Is it PCP? Because patient can present at this stage in any immunosuppressed person, even before lung signs occur and imaging shows any typical findings because as we know once the pcp pneumonia developed the mortality is very high so suggestive pd levels were normal and bacterium ds2 tds was started promptly at the same time late differentiation syndrome was considered dexamethasone restarted at right you stopped temporarily fever settled in 48 hours cough reduced in 72 hours and patient completely stable so whether this was PCV or late differentiation uh, is questionable, but the patient improved. 
and this was just to show there are number of papers available so it's a known entity late late differentiation syndrome can occur between day 17 to day 24 so this possibility has to be kept in mind now moving further a few interesting slides this is taken next all three slides are taken from the ash education booklet 2021 so this disease aml as we know is a very dreadful disease very expensive disease but there are patients who take treatment those who don't require transplant the treatment cost is 8 to 15 lakhs and those who require transplant the treatment can be more than 20 or if a mud transplant so very high so what these investigations or how these investigations are helping us is to risk stratify whether they are good risk intermediate risk or high risk so why this is interesting the workup of leukemia will cost between 30 to 50,000. The cost of disease is 10 to 30,000, depending on what you do. So in this cost, this 30 to 40,000 is a very small amount. So that we have to remember. And so how this investigation is helping, we know that we do karyotyping, fish panel, and next generation sequencing, or PCR, or SEBBP, and other things. So this is what we all do. The one who is willing for the treatment, we start the induction, the induction will finish in one month. And by that time, all these reports are ready because for to start the treatment, you require a flow cytometry and a morphology. So you can see these are poor risk. Now after doing what is good risk is fine. We all know that good risk, you give induction three cycles of consolidation and probably a maintenance after consolidation. So the problem is poor risk. So all these findings, if they are there, so this poor risk disease, you cannot cure with chemotherapy alone, that person requires a transplant. So this is very important. Now the person completes induction, induction also costs between two to five lakhs. Now, after that, we all have the, all these results in our hand. And if the patient cannot go for transplant and if he or she is in the high risk category, then there is no point in continuing the consolidation chemotherapy on because that is going to waste that person's money. So this is where these investigations are helping us and to whom not to treat is the main thing for the disease like AML. Now this is available, these diagrams like this are available for all the leukemias. So this is where we are at the moment. So we are refusing treatment to those who don't have money, those who cannot afford treatment based on these investigations. This is again from Edge booklet. This is the drug which is available now, Mardostorin in FLT3 inhibitor. Sorafenib is also available. So this is very important slide for us. Venetoclax is available, though very expensive, but available for those who need it. And this oral azacitidine is available. So the, all these drugs are available. Glitritinib is likely to come. So this is what it interests when you are at this stage, because we want drugs. We know that we have diagnostic facilities, we can prognostic, but there are no drugs. Drugs are always expensive in the beginning, but the cost will reduce later anyways. Now, this is the very simple disease for us, at least the one with low risk and intermediate risk so-called score, not one with the blood crisis. We have four drugs available in India, hematinib, desertinib, bosotinib and nilotinib. Now these two drugs are coming in, ponatinib was available in between. Now there was news that lupin is going to come up with it. But this is very interesting new data on asiminib by the Tim Hughes group from Royal Adelaide Hospital. The simplicity is that why I'm telling this, not for the drug set, but just look at this this abnormal T351. So these all are picked up by molecular studies. So again, in CML, those who are not responding to first line TKA, we are doing what is called as imatinib resistant mutation analysis. It's a PCR based test. So anybody to whom we are going to recommend this drug, we have to have this data in our hand. And that's what is it is interesting. It's not the case, but the investigation. So once we have, so Practically, we can we are able to tailor made the treatment for, for hematomalic, hematological malignancies nowadays. And few days back, we had chat with Dr. Bhausai Bagal at Shirdi. Everything is expensive, that is fine, but it is available to those who can afford it. And uh, it is very 
saddening that ICMR did conduct some studies and only 30% of cancer patients, not hematological, but all cancer patients, only 30% of cancer patients in India are able to complete the treatment. So that is the fact, but this is available. Now, how these investigations help? We know whom to give what and whom to deny treatment because everything we have to spend from our pocket. So I finished here and I thank you all for your patient listening and have a nice day and enjoy lunch. Thank you.